Chapter 39 The Ultimate Investor So the question remains, how does a person like Bill Gates become the richest business person in the world in his 30s? Or how does Warren Buffett become one of the richest investors in America? Both men came from middle class families so they were not handed the keys to the family vault. Yet, even without great family wealth behind them, they rocketed to the apex of wealth within a span of a few years. How? They did it the way many of the ultra-rich have done so in the past and will be doing so in the future. They became ultimate investors by creating an asset that is worth billions of dollars. Fortune magazine ran a cover story entitled Young and Rich, The 40 Wealthiest Americans Under 40. Some of these young billionaires were the following, Number 1, Michael Dell, age 34, net worth $21.5 billion, business Dell Computer, Number 2, Jeff Bezos, age 35, net worth $5.7 billion, business Amazon.com, Number 3, Ted Waite, age 36, net worth $5.40, billion, business Gateway, Number 4, Pierre Omidyar, age 32, Net worth $3.7 billion, business eBay, number 5, David Filo, age 33, net worth $3.1 billion, business Yahoo, number 6, David Yang, age 30, net worth $3.0 billion, business Yahoo, number 7, Henry Nicholas, age 39, net worth $2.40, billion, business Broadcom, number 8, Rob Glazer, age 37, net worth $2.3 billion, business real networks, number 9, Scott Bloom, age 35, net worth $1.7 billion, business buy.com, number 10, Jeff Skull, age 33, net worth $1.40, billion, business eBay, you may notice that the top 10 of the top 40 young rich are from computer or internet companies. Yet there were other types of businesses listed as well, number 26, John Chitner, age 37, net worth $403 million, business Papa John's Pizza, number 28, Master P, age 29, net worth $361 million, business recording star, number 29, Michael Jordan, age 36, net worth $357 million, business sports star, I find it interesting to note that the non-internet related rich people came from businesses such as a pizza company, the rap music business, and sports. Everyone else was in computers or the internet. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett did not make the list because they were over 40. In 2000, Bill Gates was 44 and worth $85 billion. Warren Buffett was 70 and worth $31 billion according to Forbes. They made it the old-fashioned way. So how did most of these people join the ranks of the ultra-rich so early in life? They made it the old-fashioned way the same way that Rockefeller, Carnegie, and Ford became yesterday's ultra-rich, and the same way that tomorrow's ultra-rich will do it. They built companies and sold shares in their company to the public. They worked hard to become selling shareholders rather than buying shareholders. In other words, it could be said that by being selling shareholders, they printed their own money legally. They created a valuable business and then sold shares of ownership in the business to others. In Rich Dad Poor Dad, I wrote about how at the age of nine, I began making my own money by melting down lead toothpaste tubes and forging lead coins in plaster of Paris molds. My poor dad told me what the word counterfeiting meant. My first business opened and closed on the same day. My rich dad, on the other hand, told me that I was very close to the ultimate formula for wealth, to print or invent your own money legally. And that is what the ultimate investor does. In other words, why work hard for money when you can print your own? In Rich Dad Poor Dad, Rich Dad's lesson number 5 is, the rich invent money. Rich Dad taught me to invent my own money with real estate or with small companies. That technical skill is the domain of the inside and ultimate investors. How 10% own 90% of the shares. 
One reason the wealthiest 10% own 90% of all the shares of stock, as reported in the Wall Street Journal, is that the wealthiest 10% include the ultimate investors, the people who created the shares of stock. Another reason is that only this 10% is eligible, per SEC rules, to invest in a company at the early stages before it becomes available to the public through an IPO. In this elite group are founders of companies, aka founding shareholders, friends of the founders, or a select list of investors. These are the people who become richer and richer while the rest of the population often struggles to make ends meet, investing the few dollars they may have left over, if they have any dollars left at all, as buying shareholders. The difference between selling and buying. The ultimate investor is someone who builds a company and sells shares in his or her company. When you read an IPO prospectus, ultimate investors are the ones listed as the selling shareholders. They are not buying shareholders. And as you can tell by the net worth of these individuals, there seems to be a tremendous difference in wealth between those who sell and those who buy shares. The last leg. By 1994, I felt I had successfully completed much of the plan Rich Dad and I had created back in 1974. I felt relatively comfortable with my abilities to manage most of the components of the BI triangle. I understood corporate law well enough to talk to an attorney or accountant. I knew the differences among the entity types, S Corporation, an LLC, an LLP, a C Corporation, and a limited partnership, and when to use one versus the other. I felt fairly comfortable with my ability to successfully buy and manage real estate investments. By 1994, our expenses were under control and we converted as many as possible to pre-tax business expenses. We paid little in ordinary income tax simply because we did not have jobs or salaries. Most of our income was in the form of passive income with a little from portfolio income. We had some income from investments in other people's businesses. One day, while I was evaluating my tetrahedron, it became glaringly obvious that one leg of my tetrahedron was really weak the leg dedicated to paper assets. My tetrahedron looked like this, for better knowledge have a blueprint. In 1994, I felt good about my success. Kim and I were financially free and could afford not to work for the rest of our lives. However, it was obvious that one leg of my tetrahedron was weaker. My financial empire looked out of balance. I took a year off in the mountains between 1994 and 1995 and spent a lot of time contemplating the idea of strengthening the last leg, paper assets. I had to decide if I really wanted to do all the work needed to strengthen it. I was doing okay financially and, in my mind, I really did not need much more in the way of paper assets to be financially secure. I was fine exactly the way I was, and I could have gotten richer and richer without paper assets. After a year of mental turmoil and vacillation, I decided that the paper asset leg of my portfolio needed to be strengthened. If I did not do so, I would be quitting on myself. That was a disturbing thought. I also had to decide if I wanted to invest from the outside, as most people did when it came to buying stocks in companies. In other words, I needed to decide if I wanted to be a buying shareholder and invest from the outside, or learn to invest from the inside. Either would be a learning experience, almost like starting over. It is relatively easy to get into the inside of a real estate deal or the acquisition of a small business. That is why I recommend to individuals who are serious about gaining experience in the 10 investor controls to start with small deals in those types of investments. However, to get to the inside of a company before it went public, through a pre-IPO, was another story. Generally, to be invited to invest in a company before it goes public is reserved for a very elite group of people, and I did not belong to that elite group. I was not rich enough, and my money was too new for me to belong to the elite group. In addition, I do not come from the right family or university. My blood is red, not blue. My skin is not white, and Harvard has no record of my application to its prestigious institution. I had to learn how to become part of the elite group that is invited to invest in the best companies before they go public. 
I felt sorry for myself for a few moments, enjoying a brief moment of self-doubt, a lack of self-confidence, and a strong dose of self-pity. Rich Dad had already passed on, and I had no one to turn to for advice. After my few moments of misery were over, I realized that this is a free country. If Bill Gates can drop out of college, build a company, and take it public, why can't I? Isn't this why we want to live in a free country? Can't we be as rich or poor as we want? Isn't this why the barons in 1215 forced King John to sign the Magna Carta? In late 1994, I decided that since no one was going to ask me to join the Insiders Club, I might have to find one and ask to be invited to join or start my own club. The problem was that I did not know where to start especially in Phoenix, Arizona, 2,000 miles from Wall Street. On New Year's Day 1995, my best friend Larry and I hiked up to a mountaintop near our home. We went through our annual New Year's Day ritual of discussing our past year, planning for the next year, and writing down our goals for the coming year. We spent about three hours up on the rocky peak discussing our lives, the past year, and our hopes, dreams, and goals for the future. Larry and I have been best friends for many years, we started at Xerox together in Honolulu in 1974. He had become my new best friend because, at that stage of my life, he and I had more in common than Mike and I did. Mike was already very, very rich, and Larry and I were just starting out with virtually nothing but a strong desire to become very, very rich. Larry and I spent years together as partners, starting several businesses. Many of those businesses failed even before they got off the drawing board. When he and I reflect back on some of those businesses, we laugh at how naive we were back then. Yet some of those businesses did very well. We were partners in starting the nylon and velcro wallet business in 1977 and developing it into a worldwide business. We became best friends through starting businesses together and have remained best friends ever since. After the nylon and velcro wallet business began to fail in 1979, Larry moved back to Arizona and began to build his fame and fortune as a real estate developer. In 1995, Inc. magazine named him America's fastest growing home builder, and he joined its prestigious list of fast growing entrepreneurs. In 1991, Kim and I moved to Phoenix for the weather and golf, but more importantly for the millions of dollars of real estate the federal government was giving away for pennies on the dollar. On that bright New Year's Day in 1995, I showed Larry the diagram of my tetrahedron and my need to increase my paper assets leg. I shared my desire to either invest in a company before it went public, or maybe even build a company and take it public. At the end of my explanation, all Larry said was, good luck. We ended that day by writing our goals on 3x5 cards and shaking hands. We wrote down our goals because Rich Dad had always said, goals have to be clear, simple, and in writing. If they are not in writing and reviewed daily, they are not really goals. They are wishes. Sitting on the chilly mountain peak, we then went over Larry's goal of selling his business and retiring. At the end of his explanation, I shook his hand and said, good luck, and we hiked back down the mountain. Periodically, I would review what I had written on that 3x5 card. My goal was simple. It stated, to invest in a company before it goes public and acquire 100,000 shares or more for less than $1 per share. At the end of 1995, nothing had happened. I had not achieved my goal. On New Year's Day 1996, Larry and I sat on the same mountain peak and discussed our results for the year. Larry's company was on the verge of being sold, but it had not yet happened, so neither of us had accomplished our goals for 1995. Larry was close to achieving his goal, but I seemed far away from achieving mine. Larry asked if I wanted to drop the goal or choose something new. As we discussed the goal, I began to realize that, although I had written the goal, I did not believe that it was possible for me. In my soul, I did not really believe that I was smart enough, qualified enough, or that anyone wanted me to belong to that elite group. The more we talked about my goal, 
the angrier I got at myself for doubting myself and putting myself down so much. After all, Larry said, you have paid your dues. You know how to build and run a profitable private company. Why shouldn't you be a valuable asset to a team that takes a company public? After rewriting our goals and shaking hands, I walked down the mountain with a lot of nervousness and self-doubt because I now wanted my goal more than ever. I also walked down with more determination to have my goal become reality. Nothing happened for about six months. I would read my goal in the morning and then go about my daily activities, which at that time was to produce my cash flow board game. One day my neighbor Mary knocked on my door and said, I have a friend I think you should meet. I asked her why. All she said was, I don't know. I just think the two of you would get along. He's an investor like you. I trusted Mary, so I agreed to meet her friend for lunch. A week or two later, I met her friend Frank for lunch at a golf club in Scottsdale, Arizona. Frank is a tall, distinguished man who is well-spoken and about the same age my own dad would have been if he were still alive. As lunch went on, I found out that Frank had spent much of his adult life on Wall Street, owning his own brokerage firm, occasionally forming companies and taking them public. He has had his own companies listed on the American Exchange, the Canadian Exchanges, NASDAQ, and on the big board of the New York Stock Exchange. Not only was he a person who created assets, he was a person who invested from the other side of the coin of the public stock markets. I knew he could guide me into a world very few investors ever see. He could guide me through the looking glass, get me behind the scenes, and increase my understanding of the greatest capital markets of the world. After retiring, he had moved to Arizona with his wife and lived in relative seclusion on his own desert estate, far away from the hustle and bustle of the growing city of Scottsdale. When Frank told me that he had been involved in taking nearly 100 companies public during his career, I knew why I was having lunch with him. Not wanting to appear too excited or overly aggressive, I did my best to control myself. Frank is a very private individual and grants time to very few people. Lunch ended pleasantly without my discussing what I wanted to discuss. As I said, I did not want to appear too eager and naive. For the next two months, I called and asked for another meeting. Always the gentleman, Frank would politely say no or avoid setting a time to get together. Finally, he said yes and gave me directions to his home, way out in the desert. We set a date, and I began rehearsing what I wanted to say. After a week of waiting, I found myself driving up to his home. The first thing that greeted me was a beware of dog sign. My heart raced as I drove up his long driveway, and then I saw a large black lump lying in the middle of the road. It was the dog I was supposed to be wary of, and it was a very big dog. I parked the car just in front of the dog because the dog would not move out of the way. About 20 feet separated my truck and the front door of the house, and this big dog was in between. I opened the door of my truck slowly until I realized the dog was sound asleep. I slowly stepped down from the cab of the truck, but as soon as my foot hit the gravel, the dog suddenly came to life. This big black dog stood to full height. It looked at me, and I looked at it. My heart raced as I prepared to jump back into the cab of the truck. Suddenly, the dog began wagging its stubby tail as well as its whole back end and walked forward to greet me. I spent five minutes petting and being licked to death by this large black guard dog. My wife Kim and I have a personality rule when it comes to business, never do business with pets you don't trust. Over the years, we have discovered that people and their pets are very similar. One time we did a real estate transaction with a husband and wife who had many pets. He loved small dogs known as pugs, and she loved colorful exotic birds. When Kim and I went to their house, their small cute dogs and birds appeared friendly, but once you got close to them, they were vicious. As soon as we approached them, they would snap at us and start to bark or squawk loudly and aggressively. A week after the deal was closed, Kim and I found out that the owners were just like their pets cute on the outside, but vicious on the inside. In the fine print of the contract, 
we had been bitten badly. Even our attorney at the time had missed the subtle bite. The investment came out all right, but since then, Kim and I have developed this new policy, if we are having any doubts about the people we are doing business with and they have pets, find a way to check out their pets. Humans are able to put forth a pleasant front and say things they really don't mean with a smile, but their pets don't lie. Over the years, we have found this simple guideline to be fairly accurate. We have found that a person's insides are reflected on his or her pets outside. My meeting with Frank was therefore off to a good start. The meeting with Frank did not go so well at first. I asked Frank if I could apprentice with him and be an inside investor with him. I told him that I would work for free if he would teach me what he knew about the process of taking a company public. I explained to him that I was financially free and that I did not need money to work with him. Frank was skeptical for about an hour. He and I went back and forth discussing the value of his time and questioning my ability to learn quickly and my willingness to stick with the process. He was afraid that I would quit once I found out how hard it was, since my background was weak when it came to finance and the capital markets such as Wall Street. He also said, I've never had anyone offer to work for free just so they could learn from me. The only times people have ever asked me for anything is when they wanted to borrow money or they wanted a job. I reassured him that all I wanted was the opportunity to work with him and to learn. I told him about my rich dad guiding me for years and my working for free much of the time. Finally, he asked, how badly do you want to learn this business? I looked him squarely in the eye and said, I want to learn it very badly. Good, he said. I am currently looking at a bankrupt gold mine located in the Andes Mountains of Peru. If you really want to learn from me, then fly to Lima this Thursday, inspect the mine with my team, meet with the bank, find out what it wants for it, return, and give me a report on your findings. And by the way, this entire trip is at your own expense. I sat there with a stunned look on my face. Fly to Peru this Thursday. I restated. Frank smiled, still want to join my team and learn the business of taking a company public. My stomach turned into a knot, and I broke out in a mild cold sweat. I knew my sincerity was being tested. This was a Tuesday, and I had appointments already scheduled for Thursday. Frank sat patiently as I thought over my options. Finally, he asked quietly with a very pleasant tone and smile, well, still want to learn my business. I knew I was at a defining moment. I knew it was time to put up or shut up. I was now testing myself. My choice had nothing to do with Frank. It had everything to do with the next evolution of my personal development. At times like this, I recall the wisdom of the great philosopher Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless dreams and splendid plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. It is the phrase, then providence moves too that keeps me taking a step forward when the rest of me wants to step backwards. Webster defines providence as divine guidance or care. God conceived as the power sustaining and guiding human destiny. Whenever I come to the edge of my world or when I am about to take a step into the unknown, all I have at that moment is my trust in a larger power. It is at such moments, when I know I must step over the edge, that I take a deep breath and take the step. It can be called a leap of faith. I call it a test of my trust in a power much bigger than myself. In my opinion, it is those first steps that have made all the difference in my life. The initial results have not always been as I would have liked them to be, but my life has always changed for the better in the long run. I have a deep respect for Goethe's couplet, whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. As Goethe's words faded, I looked up and said, I'll be in Peru this Thursday. 
Frank smiled a wide quiet smile. Here is a list of people you are to meet and where to meet them. Call me when you get back. This is not a recommendation. This is definitely not the path I would recommend for anyone wanting to learn to take a company public. There are smarter and easier paths. Yet this was the path that was laid out for me. Therefore, I will faithfully describe to you the process by which I came to achieve my goal. In my opinion, everyone must be true to his or her own mental and emotional strengths and weaknesses. I am simply relating the process I went through once I knew the next direction in my life. It was not mentally hard, but it was emotionally challenging, as most significant changes in life tend to be. Rich Dad often said, an individual's reality is the boundary between self-confidence and faith. He would draw a diagram that looked like this, he would then say, the boundaries of a person's reality often do not change until that person forsakes what he or she feels confident in and then goes blindly with faith. So many people do not become rich because they are limited by their self-confidence rather than the limitlessness of faith. On that Thursday in the summer of 1996, I was on my way to the Andes Mountains to inspect a gold mine that was once mined by the Incas and then the Spaniards. I was taking a bold step of faith into a world I knew nothing about. Yet because of that step, a whole new world of investing opened up to me. My life has not been the same since I decided to take that step. My reality regarding what is possible financially has not been the same. My reality on how rich a person can become has expanded. The more I continue working with Frank and his team, the further those limits to wealth expand. Today, I continue to expand my limits, and I can hear my rich dad say, a person is limited only to his or her reality of what is possible financially. Nothing changes until a person's reality changes. And a person's financial reality will not change until he or she is willing to go beyond the fears and doubts of his or her own self-imposed limits. Frank kept his word. Upon returning from the trip, I reported back to Frank. The mine was a great mine with strong and proven veins of gold, but it had financial problems as well as many operational challenges. I recommended against acquiring it because the mine had severe social problems and had severe environmental problems that would have cost millions to clean up. In order to make the mine operate efficiently, any new owners would have to downsize the workforce by at least 40%. It would destroy the town's economy. I said to Frank, for centuries, these people have lived there at 16,000 feet above sea level. Generations of their families are buried there. I do not think it is wise for us to be the ones to force them to leave the home of their ancestors to seek work in the cities at the base of the mountain. I think we would have more problems than we want to deal with. Frank agreed with my findings and, more importantly, agreed to teach me. We were soon looking at mines and oil fields in other parts of the world, and a new chapter in my educational process began. From the summer of 1996 to the fall of 1997, I worked as an apprentice to Frank. He was busy working on developing his company, Easy Energy Corporation, not the real name, which was just about to go public on the Alberta Stock Exchange in Canada when I joined him. Since I was late joining his team, I was not able to acquire any of the pre-IPO shares at the insider's price. It would not have been appropriate for me to invest with the founders since I was still new and untested. Yet I was able to acquire a sizable block of stock at the IPO price of 50 cents, Canadian, a share. After striking oil in Colombia, and finding what appeared to be a large oil and gas field in Portugal, Easy Energy stock was trading at around $2 to $2.35, Canadian, a share. If and that is a qualified if, the field in Portugal proves to be as big as we hope it is, the price per share of EZ Energy could climb to $25, Canadian. That is the upside. There is also a downside with these microcap stocks. The shares could also go down to zero per share and become worthless. A lot of things are possible when companies are at this stage of development. Although EZ Energy is a very small company, the increase in value for what Frank calls the front money investors could be significant. 
these investors could potentially make a lot of money. These front money investors, pre-IPO accredited investors, invested thousands of dollars, based on Frank's reputation, the strength of the board of directors, and the business expertise of the oil exploration team. But there are no guarantees. In other words, in the beginning, this investment was all P, price, and no E, earnings. It was initially offered only to Frank's friends and his inner circle of investors. At this stage of the investment cycle, investors invest in the people on the team. The people much more than the product, be it oil, gold, an internet product, or widgets are far more important than any other part of the equation. The golden rule that money follows management is extremely important at this stage of a company's development. Rather than go into the hype, hopes, and dreams of this company, I think it best to quote you just the facts of this publicly traded company. The founders of the company put up their time and expertise in exchange for shares in the company. In other words, most of the founders work for free, investing their time and expertise in return for blocks of shares of stock. The value of their stock when issued is very small, so they have very little, if any, earned income. They work without pay intending to increase the value of their stock, which will generate portfolio income rather than earned income. A few of the founders are paid a small salary for their services. They work for the bigger payoff, which comes if they do a good job of growing the company and making it more valuable. Since most of the directors are not drawing a salary, it is in their best interest to increase and keep increasing the company's value. Their personal interest is the same as the shareholder's interest, which is an ever-increasing price per share. The same is true for many of the company's officers. They may draw a small salary, but are really more interested in the price per share going up. The founders are very, very important to the success of a startup because their reputation and expertise give credibility, confidence, momentum, and legitimacy to a project that often exists only on paper. Once the company is public and successful, some of the founders may resign, taking their stock with them. A new management team replaces them, and the founders move on to another startup, repeating the process. History of EZ Energy The following is a sequence of events that occurred after the company was founded. 1. Front money investors put up $25,000, US, for 100,000 shares, or 25 cents per share. At this stage, the company had a tentative plan, but owned no exploration leases. There were no assets. Front money investors invested in management. 2. The shares currently trade in range between $2 and $2.35, Canadian, per share. 3. Therefore, the worth of the front money investors' block of 100,000 shares rose to $200,000 to $235,000. Canadian, $160,000 to $170,000, US. The director's job now is to keep increasing the value of the company and its share price by bringing to market the oil it has found, drilling more wells, and finding more oil reserves. On paper, the front money investors have made about $140,000 on their $25,000 investment. They have been in the deal for five years so their annual rate of return would be 45% if they could sell their shares. 4. The problem for the investors is that the company is small and the shares are very thinly traded. An investor with 100,000 shares would be hard-pressed to sell 100,000 shares all at once without seriously depressing the price of the stock. So the valuation of the entire block of stock is, in many ways, a paper valuation at this time. If things go as planned, the company will grow and more people will begin to follow the company and the stock. Buying and selling larger blocks of these shares should then become easier. Due to the good news of the discoveries, most large block investors are holding on to their shares rather than selling. Why a Canadian exchange? When I first began working with Frank, I asked him why he used the Canadian exchanges rather than the more well-known Nasdaq or Wall Street. In America, the Canadian exchanges are often treated as the Rodney Dangerfields of the North American securities industry. 
yet Frank uses the Canadian exchanges because, 1, the Canadian exchanges are the world leaders for financing small natural resource companies. Frank uses them because he primarily develops these types of companies. Frank is like Warren Buffett, who tends to stay with businesses he understands. I understand oil and gas, silver and gold, Frank says. I understand natural resources and precious metals. If Frank were to develop a technology company, he would probably list it on an American exchange. 2. Nasdaq and Wall Street have gotten too big for a small company to gain any attention there. Frank said, when I started in this business in the 1950s, a small company could gain some attention from the brokers on the major exchanges. Today, internet companies, many without any earnings, are commanding more money than many larger well-known industrial age companies. Hence, most larger brokerage houses are not very interested in small companies that need to raise only a few million dollars. Brokerage houses in America are interested primarily in offerings of $100 million or more. 3. The Canadian exchanges let the small entrepreneurs stay in the business. I think Frank uses Canadian exchanges mainly because he is retired. He often says, I don't need the money, so I don't need to build a big company to make a big score. I just enjoy the game, and it keeps me active. Where else can my friends get into an IPO play for only $25,000 for 100,000 shares of stock? I do this because it's still fun, I love the challenges, and the money can be rewarding. I love starting companies, taking them public, and watching them grow. I also love having my friends and their families become rich. Frank offers a word of caution. Just because the Canadian exchanges are small does not mean that anyone can play their game. Some of the Canadian exchanges have gained a shaky reputation due to past transactions. To work with these exchanges, a person should be very familiar with the ins and outs of taking a company public. 4. The good news is that the Canadian system of stock exchanges appears to be tightening up on regulations, which are being enforced more closely. In a few years, I think the Canadian exchanges will grow as more and more small companies from all over the world look to the smaller exchanges to raise the capital they need. Beware of the stock promoter. In the few years I have been actively involved in this business, I have come across three individuals who had the right credentials as well as the right letters after their name, told a great story, raised tens of millions of dollars, and had absolutely no idea how to start a business and build. One from scratch. For several years, such people fly around in first class or on private jets, stay at the best hotels, put on lavish dinner parties, drink the best wines, and live high on the hog on their investors' money. The company soon dies because there is no actual development. The cash flow has all been going out. These people then go on to start another company and do it all over again. How do you spot a sincere entrepreneur from a big spending dreamer? That I do not know. A couple of people sure had me fooled until their companies folded. The best advice I can give is to ask for a past track record, check references, and let your sixth sense or intuition be your guide. 5. If a small company grows and prospers, it can later move from a small exchange to a bigger exchange such as NASDAQ or NYSE. Companies that make the move from a Canadian exchange to an American exchange average a substantial increase in the valuation of the company, sometimes over 200%. Most of today's big-name companies started out as small unknown companies. In 1989, Microsoft was a small company whose stock sold for $6 a share. In 1991, Cisco stock was just $3 a share, both of these stocks have since split a number of times. These companies used their investors' money wisely and grew into major powerhouses in the world economy. A difficult process. The entry requirements of the major stock markets in the United States have made the IPO a difficult process for most businesses. As described in the Ernst & Young Guide to Taking Your Company Public, the New York Stock Exchange requires a company to have net tangible assets of $18 million and pre-tax income of $2,500,000.
the American Stock Exchange requires a stockholder's equity of $4 million and a market value of the IPO to be a minimum of $3 million. And the Nasdaq National Market requires net tangible assets of at least $4 million and a market value of the IPO to be a minimum of $3 million. Many small to medium companies that cannot meet these qualifications look for reverse merger opportunities, which allow them to merge with an existing public company. Through that process, the company can become a publicly traded company by taking control of the newly combined public company. Companies may also look to other foreign exchanges, like the Canadian exchange, where the entry requirements are not as severe. Who buys Canadian? During one of my talks on investing in Australia some time ago, a member of the audience questioned my sanity at investing in precious metals and oil. He asked, if everyone else is in high-tech and internet stocks, why are you working on the dogs of the economy? I explained that it is always less expensive to be a contrarian investor, which is an investor who seeks out of favor or out of cycle stocks. A few years ago, I said, when everyone was into gold, silver, and oil, the prices of the exploration leases that make up these startups were very high. It was very difficult to find a deal at a good price. Now that the prices of oil, gold, and silver are down, finding good properties is easy and people are more willing to negotiate because these commodities are out of favor. The price of oil is now rising, making the shares in our oil company much more valuable. Also during this period, Warren Buffett announced that he was taking a sizable position in silver. In February 1998, the billionaire investor disclosed that he had acquired 130 million ounces of silver and stored it in a warehouse in London. On September 30, 1999, Canadian Business ran an article indicating that the world's richest man, Bill Gates, had made a buy in silver, acquiring a 10.3% stake for $12 million, US, of a Canadian silver company listed on the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Gates had been quietly acquiring shares in the company since February 1999. When this announcement went out to our investors, the news was welcome relief for their years of trust and confidence. You don't always hit home runs. Not all startup companies do as well as EZ Energy. Some never get off the ground even after going public, and the investors lose most, if not all, of their front money. Investors therefore need to be accredited and are warned about the all-or-nothing type of investments we bring to market. As one of Frank's partners, I speak to potential investors about becoming front-money investors in new companies. I explain the risks to potential investors before I discuss the business, the people involved, or the rewards. I often start my presentation by saying, the investment I am about to talk about is a very high-risk speculative investment, offered primarily to individuals who meet the requirements of an accredited investor. If a person does not know the requirements for being an accredited investor, I explain the guidelines as laid out by the SEC. I also stress the possibility that they can lose all of their invested money, repeating that statement several times. If they are still interested, I go on to explain that any money placed with us should never be more than 10% of their total investment capital. Then and only then, if they are still interested, do I go on to explain the investment, the risks, the team, and the possible rewards. At the end of my presentation, I ask for questions. After all the questions have been answered, I again reiterate the risks. I end by saying, if your money is lost, all I can offer you is the first opportunity to invest in our next business. By this time, most people are fully aware of the risks. I would say that 90% decide not to invest with us. We give the 10% who are still interested more information as well as more time to think things over and to back out if they desire. Many of today's high-flying internet IPOs will come crashing down in the next few years, and investors will lose millions, if not billions, of dollars. Although the internet does provide a tremendous new frontier, the forces of economics allow only a few of the pioneering companies to be winners. So regardless of whether the company going public is a gold mining company, a plumbing supply company, or an internet company, 
the forces of the public market still have much of the control. A great education. Deciding to fly to Peru turned out to be a great decision for me. I have learned as much from being Frank's student and partner as I did from my rich dad. After I put in about a year and a half as an apprentice to Frank and his team, he offered me a partnership in his private venture capital company. Since 1996, I have gained the experience of a lifetime watching EZ Energy Company go public and develop into a viable company that someday may become a major oil company. I have not only become a wiser business person because of my association, but I have also learned a great deal about how stock markets work. One of my policies is to invest five years in the learning process. My gains so far may be all paper gains, yet the business and investment education has been priceless. Maybe someday in the future, I will build a company to take public on an American exchange. Future IPOs Frank and his private venture capital team developed three other companies to bring to the public market, a precious metals company that secures leases in China, an oil company that secures oil and gas leases in Argentina, and a silver company that acquires leases in Argentina. The company that took the longest to develop was the Chinese Precious Metals Company. We were doing fine with our negotiations with the Chinese government when suddenly, in 1999, a U.S. warplane bombed the Chinese embassy in Kosovo. Whatever the reason for the bombing, the incident set our relations back two years. Yet we continued to make steady but slow progress. When people ask why we take such great risks working in China, we reply, it will soon be the largest economy in the world. Although the risks are huge, the potential payoff could be staggering. Investing in China today is like the English investing in America in the 1800s. We are investing in contacts and goodwill. We are well aware of the political differences and the human rights issues. As a company, we do our best to develop strong relationships and open communications with our contacts in China. The educational experience has been priceless for me. It is like being a part of history. Sometimes, it almost feels like being on the same boat with Columbus as he set sail for the new world. It usually takes three to five years to bring a company to the public market. When that happened, I achieved my goal of becoming an ultimate investor. It was my first public company but Frank's number 90-something. Given the risk involved, every one of these projects could have failed and never gone public. If that had happened, the pieces would have been picked up and new projects would have been started. Our investors know the risks involved and also know that their investment plan is to put a little money in several of these smaller ventures. They also know that they will be called and asked to invest in any new startup we have. All it takes is one project to hit a home run. In investments such as these, it is definitely not wise to put all your eggs in one basket. It is because of such risks that the SEC has the minimum requirements for investors in such speculative investments. The next chapter briefly outlines the basic steps of start in taking a company public is a rite of pasque with an idea, building a company, and perhaps eventually taking that company public. Although it has not been an easy process for me, it has been a very exciting one. A rite of passage, sage for any entrepreneur. It would be like a college sports star being selected to play for a professional team. According to Fortune magazine, if you're acquired, a company validates you. If you go public, the market the world validates you. That is why Rich Dad called a person who could build a company from scratch and take it public, an ultimate investor. That title eluded him. Although he invested in several businesses that ultimately did go public, None of the companies he actually started ever did go public. His son Mike took over his business and continued to grow it, but he has never built a company to take public. So becoming an ultimate investor means that I have completed Rich Dad's training process. For Rich Dad Poor Dad audiobook click on top right corner. And for Rich Dad Poor Dad audiobook playlist find the link in description. Thank you, for giving your valuable time for this video. We hope you learned something new today. Stay tuned for our next videos. Hey don't forget to subscribe, like and share this video to your friends. 
and turn on bell notification for our updates.